I'm Nikki Strong, and this is VOA One. The hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program, Brian Lynn reports on an improvements project in Washington, D.C. that involves the removal of some of the city's famous cherry trees. John Russell has a story on letters written using AI handwriting, and Gina Bennett presents this week's Ask a Teacher lesson. Later, we hear the short story Pigs is Pigs by Ellis Parker Butler. But first... Washington, D.C. officials say some of the city's famous cherry trees will need to be cut down as part of a major improvement project. Up to 1.5 million people are expected to visit America's capital in the early spring to attend the city's National Cherry Blossom Festival. The event celebrates Japan's 1912 gift to the city of about 3,000 cherry trees. During the festival, blossoms on the cherry trees are in full bloom. The main part of the festival takes place around Washington's Tidal Basin, the area near the Jefferson Memorial that has many cherry trees. But the Tidal Basin, which is connected to the nearby Potomac River, is in need of repairs. Currently, when water levels rise, flooding puts some trees under several centimeters of water. The improvement work will aim to build up and improve an old seawall meant to hold back the floodwaters. The U.S. National Park Service oversees the tidal basin as well as the large green area of downtown Washington, D.C., known as the National Mall. Officials say about 300 trees, including nearly 160 cherry trees, will be cut down during the work. After the improvements, about 300 trees will be planted as replacements. Mike Litterst is a spokesman for the National Park Service. He told the Associated Press, AP, the $133 million project is expected to take about three years. It's certainly going to benefit the visitor experience, and that's very important to us, Litterst said. But he added that most of all, it would benefit the cherry trees, who right now are every day, twice a day, seeing their roots inundated with the brackish water of the tidal basin. Litterst said the removed trees will be ground up and mixed with nutrient-rich soil, to be used to protect the roots of surviving trees. This way, the effort can be seen as providing a good second life for the trees being cut down, he added. One of the trees set to be removed from around the tidal basin received so much attention in 2020 that it became a social media star. The tree, nicknamed Stumpy, is short and oddly shaped compared to others in the area. Officials said the U.S. National Arboretum came up with a way to save the memory of Stumpy. Scientists plan to capture genetic material and use it to create new copies or clones of the famous tree. 
Organizers of the yearly event said that because of changing climate, the festival's peak bloom is beginning earlier and earlier. The peak period describes when at least 70% of the city's 3,700 cherry trees will be flowering. I'm Brian Lynn. Humans have been writing by hand for thousands of years. Since ancient times, people have used every tool imaginable to share information, do business, and keep records. But as computers took over the job and the typewritten word became more common, something was lost in the process, namely the charm and personal nature. Of a handwritten note or letter, now letter writing is making a comeback in the form of artificial intelligence-operated robots. These AI robots can write notes for humans in their own handwriting. David Wax is the head and founder of Handwritten. He said businesses use his company's robots for handwritten letters. And thank you notes to create a strong and personal connection with those who receive them. Many nonprofit organizations also use handwritten letters to keep donations coming. It helps turn one-time givers or donors into yearly givers. Wax explained. Wax added, "I think what's old is new again." Automated letter writing is not new. Thomas Jefferson, the third U.S. president, often used a polygraph created by British inventor John Isaac Hawkins. Jefferson considered the device the greatest invention of his time. It let him make copies of his letters to keep for his own records. Charles Morrill is a historian and professional woodworker who worked as a guide for several years at Monticello, Jefferson's Virginia home, from 1770 until his death in 1826. Morrill said about the polygraph, "Jefferson falls in love with this, and it becomes, in many ways, the hobby of his presidency. He keeps buying machines." And exchanges ones that are not quite perfect for the next one that's a little bit better. The president had more than ten of the devices at one point. Morrill added, using what he considered wonderful technology, historians say Jefferson went on to write almost twenty thousand letters in his lifetime. Handwriting technology has greatly changed. Since Jefferson's time, Wax says such technology now includes 3D printing and laser cutting, among others. And if users need help thinking of exactly what to write in their notes, they can choose AI to help them create a more effective message. Whether via the printing press or the polygraph, a computer or a robot, one thing is clear. Humans will use whatever tool they have to express themselves through the printed word. I'm John Russell. Hello. This week on Ask a Teacher, we answer a question from a reader in Burma, also known as Myanmar. Dear teacher, I am from Burma. I read the following sentence from a book. In Norway, 
there's an art museum for children's art. The book mentioned it is a complex sentence. I am wondering if it's right or not. Please tell me. Thank you. I wish you all the best. Your loyal reader, Kya Zin Uyu. Thank you for writing, Kya. Before we answer your question, we need to review some terms and their meanings. A clause is a grammar unit organized around a verb phrase. A clause is made of two parts. A subject, the topic of a clause, and a verb, what is said about the topic. For example, we laughed is a clause. We is the subject and laughed is the verb. In the morning is not a clause because it does not have a verb. There are two main kinds of clauses. Independent clauses are not dependent on any other clause. They are sentences on their own. We laughed is an independent clause. A dependent clause depends on an independent clause. It cannot be a sentence on its own. Before I went, for example, is a dependent clause because although it has a subject and a verb, it requires additional information to be a full thought. We can sort sentences into three groups by the clauses they have. A sentence must have at least one independent clause. The independent clause is a simple sentence. For example, it snowed last night. When a sentence has two or more independent clauses, it is a compound sentence. For example, I went to the party, but he stayed home. When a sentence has at least one independent clause, as well as one or more dependent clauses, it is a complex sentence. For example, I'll call you when I get home. Now, to answer your question, Kyo, your example has only one clause. This means it is a simple sentence, not a complex sentence. There are seven simple sentence patterns in English, but we can talk about those another day. We hope this explanation has helped you, Kyo. Do you have a question about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Gina Bennett. Dr. Gina is here now to talk more about this week's Ask a Teacher. In this week's program, we learned about clauses and how they make sentences. Right. One independent clause is a simple sentence. We can combine independent and dependent clauses to make compound and complex sentences. Does it really matter if I know whether a sentence is simple, compound, or complex? No, not really. 
What does matter is that you recognize a dependent clause so that you don't use incomplete and incorrect sentences. You said that before I went is a dependent clause, so even though it has a subject and a verb, if we use this as a sentence, it wouldn't be correct. That's right. Before I went starts with a subordinator or a word that introduces a dependent clause. If you recognize the subordinator, then you know this clause can't be a sentence by itself. Are there a lot of subordinators? Is it hard to learn them all? Well, yes and no. There are a lot of subordinators, but they mostly add information like time, reason, concession, or condition. The clause before I went is adding information about time. So now we can be sure we have complete sentences by recognizing dependent clauses and only using them with an independent clause. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Gina. Next up is the VOA Learning English program, American Stories. Our story today is called Pigs is Pigs. It was written by Ellis Parker Butler. Here is Shep O'Neill with the story. Mike Flannery, the agent of the Interurban Express Company, leaned over the desk in the company's office in Westcott and shook his fist. Mr. Morehouse, angry and red, stood on the other side of the desk, shaking with fury. The argument had been long and hot. At last, Mr. Morehouse had become speechless. The cause of the trouble lay on the desk between the two men. It was a box with two guinea pigs inside. Do as you like, then, shouted Flannery. Pay for them and take them, or don't pay for them and leave them here. Rules are rules, Mr. Morehouse, and Mike Flannery is not going to break them. But you stupid idiot, shouted Mr. Morehouse, madly shaking a thin book beneath the agent's nose. Can't you read it here? In your own book of transportation rates? Pets, domestic, Franklin to Westcott, if correctly boxed, 25 cents each. He threw the book on the desk. What more do you want? Aren't they pets? Aren't they domestic? Aren't they correctly boxed? What? He turned and walked back and forth rapidly with a furious look on his face. Pets, he said. P-E-T-S. Twenty-five cents each. Two times twenty-five is fifty. Can you understand that? I offer you fifty cents. Flannery reached for the book. He ran his hand through the pages and stopped at page 64. I don't take 50 cents, he whispered in an unpleasant voice. Here's the rule for it. When the agent be in any doubt about which two rates should be charged on a shipment, he shall charge the larger. The person receiving the shipment may put in a claim for the overcharge. In this case, Mr. Morehouse, I be in doubt. Pets them animals may be, and domestic they may be, but pigs I'm sure they do be, and my rule says plain as the nose on your face, pigs, Franklin to Westcott, 30 cents each. Mr. Morehouse shook his head savagely. Nonsense, he shouted. Confounded nonsense, I tell you. That rule means common pigs, not guinea pigs. Pigs is pigs, Flannery said firmly. Mr. Morehouse bit his lip and then flung his arms out wildly. 
Very well, he shouted. You shall hear of this. Your president shall hear of this. It is an outrage. I have offered you fifty cents. You refuse it. Keep the pigs until you are ready to take the fifty cents. But by George, sir, if one hair of those pigs' heads is harmed, I will have the law on you. He turned and walked out, slamming the door. Flannery carefully lifted the box from the desk and put it in a corner. Mr. Morehouse quickly wrote a letter to the president of the Transportation Express Company. The president answered, informing Mr. Morehouse that all claims for overcharge should be sent to the claims department. Mr. Morehouse wrote to the claims department. One week later, he received an answer. The claims department said it had discussed the matter with the agent at Westcott. The agent said Mr. Morehouse had refused to accept the two guinea pigs shipped to him. Therefore, the department said, Mr. Morehouse had no claim against the company and should write to its tariff department. Mr. Morehouse wrote to the tariff department. He stated his case clearly. The head of the tariff department read Mr. Morehouse's letter. Ha, huh, guinea pigs, he said. Probably starved to death by this time. He wrote to the agent asking why the shipment was held up. He also wanted to know if the guinea pigs were still in good health. Before answering, Agent Flannery wanted to make sure his report was up to date. So he went to the back of the office and looked into the cage. Good Lord, there were now eight of them, all well and eating like hippopotamuses. He went back to the office and explained to the head of the tariff department what the rules said about pigs. And as for the condition of the guinea pigs, said Flannery, they were all well. But there were eight of them now, all good eaters. The head of the tariff department laughed when he read Flannery's letter. He read it again and became serious. By George, he said, Flannery is right. Pigs is pigs. I'll have to get something official on this. He spoke to the president of the company. The president treated the matter lightly. What is the rate on pigs and on pets, he asked. Pigs, 30 cents. Pets, 25, the head of the tariff department answered. Then, of course, guinea pigs are pigs, the president said. Yes, the head of the tariff department agreed. I look at it that way, too. A thing that can come under two rates is naturally to be charged at the higher one. But are guinea pigs pigs? Aren't they rabbits? Come to think of it, the president said, I believe they are more like rabbits, sort of halfway between pig and rabbit. I think the question is this. Are guinea pigs of the domestic pig family? I'll ask Professor Gordon. He is an expert about such things. The president wrote to Professor Gordon. Unfortunately, the professor was in South America, collecting zoological samples. His wife forwarded the letter to him. The professor was in the high Andes Mountains. The letter took many months to reach him. In time, the president forgot the guinea pigs. The head of the tariff department forgot them. Mr. Morehouse forgot them. 
but Agent Flannery did not. The guinea pigs had increased to 32. He asked the head of the traffic department what he should do with them. Don't sell the pigs, Agent Flannery was told. They are not your property. Take care of them until the case is settled. The guinea pigs needed more room. Flannery made a large and airy room for them in the back of his office. Some months later, he discovered he now had 160 of them. He was going out of his mind. Not long after this, the president of the express company heard from Professor Gordon. It was a long and scholarly letter. It pointed out that the guinea pig was the cavia aporia, while the common pig was the genus sus of the family suidae. The president then told the head of the traffic department that guinea pigs are not pigs and must be charged only 25 cents as domestic pets. The traffic department informed Agent Flannery that he should take the 160 guinea pigs to Mr. Morehouse and collect 25 cents for each of them. Agent Flannery wired back, I've got 800 now. Shall I collect for 800 or what? How about the $64 I paid for cabbages to feed them? Many letters went back and forth. Flannery was crowded into a few feet at the extreme front of the office. The guinea pigs had all the rest of the room. Time kept moving on as the letters continued to go back and forth. Flannery now had 4,064 guinea pigs. He was beginning to lose control of himself. Then he got a telegram from the company that said, Error in guinea pig bill. Collect for two guinea pigs 50 cents. Flannery ran all the way to Mr. Morehouse's home, but Mr. Morehouse had moved. Flannery searched for him in town, but without success. He returned to the express office and found that 206 guinea pigs had entered the world since he left the office. At last, he got an urgent telegram from the main office. Send the pigs to the main office of the company at Franklin. Flannery did so. Soon came another telegram. Stop sending pigs. Warehouse full. But he kept sending them. Agent Flannery finally got free of the guinea pigs. Rules may be rules, he said, but so long as Flannery runs this express office, pigs is pets, and cows is pets, and horses is pets, and lions and tigers and Rocky Mountain goats is pets, and the rate on them is 25 cents. Then... He looked around and said cheerfully, Well, anyhow, it is not as bad as it might have been. What if them guinea pigs had been elephants? And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak.